can be iron based alloys, nickel based alloys, and cobalt based alloys, and it's usually, but not only for this temperature, for 400 to 800. As long as the carbon activity is greater than one, it can happen at any temperature. And the most common gas are hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide. And so now we'll just go into the general mechanisms. And so general mechanisms, our reaction mechanism here, as you can see, is a uh, metal that's been occurring in iron and low alloy steels. And as you see on the right-hand side, the transfer of carbon, which then leads from the dissociation of carbon oxide, then leads to the creation of cementite. And cementite forms on the surface of the alloy. So once it forms on the surface of the alloy, it kind of prevents carbon transfer, which then makes it unstable. Mm -hmm. And it making it unstable then forms into the graphite precipitation that you see on the third. And then following into our graphite precipitation, then breaks down into the creation of our catalyst, which then leads to the coking, which excessively with the continuous rebuilding of this process and consistency, that's why it turns into dusting, essentially metal dusting, being the withering away of equipment entirely. So for the dynamics, as we all know, um in the case of metal dusting, our driving force is the activity of the carbon. So for us to do that, we have the equations of the syn gas, which is the synthesized mixture of the um, equations involving um, formation of, of carbon, plus carbon dioxide or carbon, carbon monoxide and hydro hydrogen to give us the mixture. So based on this activity that we know how to calculate for our um, corrosion um, lecture, we can determine if at all our activity is greater than uh, one or equal to one or higher. From there, we can know how this common, this uh, metal dust is going to take place or not. Mm -hmm. But you know that it's a difference. In this case, they address the calculation of the carbon activity by defining the constant for the equilibrium. Mm -hmm. We bypass that process mm -hmm. by using the delta G a standard of the reaction definition. Because sometimes the KP, KP1 value is not always are easy for people to digest on how you get there and even to manipulate it. So we bypass that and we, we should arrive to the same to the same value. Yeah. Is it a consistent thing within industry? Uh, yeah, a lot of people migrate the concept of equilibrium, the KP, a constant from chemistry. So for the process of metal dusting, we have, um, as mentioned earlier by Omo, this is uh, what we have, question of the, uh, of the, of the uh, carbon on the surface of the metal, uh, of the same type. So we have um, the oxide formation, the carbide formation, and we have carbon dioxide to be great. It's simply a combination of what we said earlier, so this is how it's going to take place. Right. Yeah. And then here are a few examples of uh, what it looks like when metal dusting sort of uh, affects the metals. Uh, right here we have uh, some pitting, we have some crater formation uh, on the middle, and then, or like dimples that form uh, as part of the dusting uh, process. And then uh, over here, the metal surface uh, corroding. Uh, so yeah, these are some sort of signs to look out for that uh, sort of indicate that uh, your metal has kind of gone under, undergone the metal yeah. dusting. So certain areas in which um, you can typically observe metal dusting and where it's observed is usually through chemical and petro petrochemical industries because of the high temperature. Um, it is relatively due to the high temperatures that are required for the environment to occur. That's usually a space where it's often seen. And reformers and direct reduction plants, um, seen as the process itself can come from the reduction of carbon dioxide. Um, and then in the processes that generate syn gas, which there will be two um, instances that we'll kind of speak on next right now. So these are the two instances um, which we were previously talking about. A moss gas plant uh, that converts natural gas to synthetic transportation and metal dusting was caused. Um, the disintegration in the burner line in the secondary reformer causing for a meltdown in part of that reformer, uh, which essentially led to um, a huge accident. And then also in the DSM fertilizer plant, a Dutch chemical company, mm -hmm. Um, they went ahead and they produced ammonium and they had metal dusting occur. However, it wasn't as catastrophic, but it was significant enough to where they had to replace a lot of equipment. And of course, the cost efficiency of that was you know, terrible. 
Was it demonstrated that was metal dosing? Pardon? Was it demonstrated that was metal dosing? Um, yes, yeah, so the paper I read mm -hmm. had established it as metal dusting, mm -hmm. but another one that I had read or reading on that actual incident itself, it made it seem as though it wasn't guaranteed. Right, but it was not surprised having ammonia in the environment would uh, normally neutralize the CO. Mm -hmm. Do you know why the laser treatment will work? So I read a paper on laser treatment, and essentially it started with its prevention of reducing the carbon transfer. Uh -huh, how? You know it. When you laser melt a surface, what happens? Are you like laser melting? Breaking the, the grain boundary, and by that you stop the Diffusion. Right. And you also, since it cools so quickly, because you reach relatively high surfaces at a very localized surface, you usually create a glass, a metal glass, meaning it doesn't have any crystallographic structure. But that is short lived because the moment that is uh, put into operation, if it reaches the gas transition temperature, the glass transition temperature of the metal, it reverts back to crystalline. What is that? You eliminate the green boundaries by creating a glassy metal structure. But we are afraid that only in the low temperature, 400 to 500, is no guarantee going to go higher. Okay, some advantages and disadvantages. Also, uh, no modification of process is necessary uh, when preventing, when using the prevention methods that we spoke about earlier. Uh, cost will decrease with less frequent, uh, frequency of uh, changing uh, the, uh, the damaged equipment. Uh, if alloys can generate uh, more chromium mm -hmm. oxide and less spin of spinel. spinel on the surface, their ability to resist metal dusting will increase. Um, disadvantages, surface treatments are short term solutions mm -hmm. and chlorine may not be applied to all types of components. Right. And I think one of the most effective is actually the formation of chromium. Okay. That is the best method you have for this kind of protection. And there you can take advantage of shot pinning as a cold war mechanism. So when the alloy goes off, recrystallize, okay, very fine grains. And that, yes, as long as you have sufficient chromium, the chromium can diffuse now very fast to the surface and protect it. It's a, it's a tricky balance there because you can promote also the intake of carbon faster if that happens faster than the chromium. Mm -hmm. So is it a time, what's the judgment as to how long the concentration. You want to have 25%, which is funny because yesterday's group reported on a failure for the alloy 747, not 347, which is the one that has the highest chromium at 25, but reported to have failed by uh, metal dosing. So what we used to do was to shot pin the surface, fine grain when it is heated up, um, because you remember from your lab, cold work can lead to grain refinement. Mm -hmm. And then by having grain refinement, you get more grain boundaries and promote chromium diffusion to the surface. Mm -hmm. For us, work, but our tests were no more than 100 hours, so that's too short for our industry. Yeah, for, I know for a snail, you have to work with the weight group manage for the metal. Yeah, to you need to be very careful not to form the spinel oxide. Mm -hmm. And that was it. <laughs> oh. 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 Oh.